be discussing a book I spent the last couple of years working on. It's titled Picking Up the Pieces, Puzzling Through Autism in the Wake of Gender, and this is what the cover design is going to look like. The actual contents of the book. Chapter one is titled A Dino Loving Girl. And chapter one quickly establishes autistics are not well known for following gender slash sex stereotypes. There's quite a bit of deviation from the norms. So then from that, chapter one asks, why is this? And one of the theories explored in chapter one is this idea that autistics really don't internalize norms, and then there's some variable levels of prioritization. So there were a handful of autistic girls, and being red is like stereotypically feminine meant a lot to them. But they had to constantly be thinking about the norms, they had to constantly be studying the norms because it wasn't something that they could readily internalize. And then it seemed to be the majority of autistics went, okay, I'm not really internalizing this. Why would it be a priority for me? <laughs> and that's part of where this title came from was as a little girl, I really liked dinosaurs. I knew it was weird to sit next to boys at lunch because the girls always sat with girls and the boys always sat with boys. But I cared a lot more about sitting next to people who could talk to me about dinosaurs than I did about being a typical little girl. So. I had some fun sitting with the boys at lunch. And then another thing that was brought up as a priority was sensory issues. There were multiple autistic men who talked about how pants cause a lot of sensory issues for them. So they have a preference for skirts or dresses. And it's kind of this trade off of, okay, wear pants, look normal, or wear skirts, but be more sensory friendly. And some found that the skirts were the better trade off between those two. So after exploring some of the social aspects of why autistics would not follow as many norms, I do hit on some biological aspects in a section I call masculinity and autistic girls. One of those theories that I hit on is the extreme male brain theory of autism. And this initially started off as just the observation that autistics are lower in empathizing and higher in systemizing, like an extreme version of the typical male profile. But since then, there have been brain scans that have found autistic girls have some masculinized brain structures. So there's much more of a physical element to it than just kind of the personality differences. And additionally, there is something called the fetal androgen theory, which puts forth that someone who is exposed to more androgens in utero would be more likely to develop autism later on. And while I couldn't find a study that specifically examined the hormones in utero, there are some studies that found like play preferences that would signify elevated androgens in utero. And then there were even some later studies that looked at adult autistic women who had blood samples from them. And relative to neurotypical women, they had elevated testosterone. So rather than just being the fetal androgen theory, it might be more of a lifelong exposure to elevated levels of testosterone. So after kind of exploring some of those social and maybe even biological differences, I move into what I call a truce with norms. So during this section, I kind of make an agreement with my readers that this book, it's not gonna call for complete abolition of sex norms. I do suspect some sex norms have a biological basis as they can be seen cross-culturally and even in other species of primates, which to me seems to signify they're deeper than even our species. And I do also say, hey, even if some of the norms are social based, for example, the norm that little girls favor playing with faces that have toys, there might be some sort of deep benefit to that, like building skills of facial recognition that will serve for later in life. So even if we do prove that these are entirely social, I'm not convinced there's something we should just toss out. And then I call this a truce with norms rather than a surrender to norms, because while I do kind of acknowledge and celebrate that very beautiful, normal thing going on, I do point out that there are going to be exceptions and that room can be made to embrace those exceptions. So after establishing that, I move into chapter two, a late language introduction. And this chapter explains some warrants that will underlie the book as well as how language will be used in the book. 
And now, initially, this was planned to be chapter one, but as my mom would say, you only get one chance to make a first impression, and I thought a dino-loving girl started off on the right foot. So the first question I address in chapter two is the question of, am I allowed to write this book? I've been told that because I'm not trans, I'm thus not qualified to talk about this issue, and I have some different kind of reasons why I think I still get to write this book. First and foremost, I'm not a standpoint theorist. I don't believe you have to be a member of an in-group to have a worthwhile opinion on the topic. You'll certainly have a different angle, but it can still be a very insightful and worthwhile angle. Additionally, I have read over 400 sources in the making of this thesis project. I have spent the last seven years observing queer spaces, so I've got that in terms of external observations. And then I am autistic, and I have found gender to be quite the bumpy ride, so I do get some of that kick of personal experience in there. And then I move into a note on truth, and this just kind of deals with how I view truth, and probably the most important thing to note is that I view truth as something that is external. I think it's out there for us to observe, not really something we can create. And then I do not believe that language creates truth, I think language can describe a truth, and I think that's a very good and worthy use of language, but it's the external thing that makes it true, not the words used to describe that. And one example I used to illustrate this is from 1984, where a very tortured Winston concludes that if everyone said a man was floating, he's floating. To me, I don't care how many people say that the man is floating. If he's not suspended in the air with nothing to support him, then he's not floating. And to start tying that to the idea of sex, I have multiple professors who refer to me with he, him pronouns. They address me as sir because they perceive me as biologically male, and I don't bother to correct them because it doesn't affect the way they teach me. So I am in these environments where I have been socially constructed as a biological male, but my breasts don't deflate. I still bleed periodically, so there is something about my femaleness that is true, regardless of the language used to describe it. And then after hitting on that I believe sex describes an underlying truth, I move into a note on gender vocabulary. And one of the first things I conclude is that gender does not have a working definition, where throughout all the sources I read, one of their most common sources of disagreement was how gender should even be defined. There were some who used it as a polite word for sex, others who used it as a sexism that holds women and girls down. That was especially common amongst feminist sources. There were some who used it as sexism you can identify with, a handful who used it as the sex you wish you were born as, and then there were some whose definitions of gender would change throughout their own piece. So just over the past two years, I've seen more and more that this word does not have a functioning definition, and that led to me developing a very strong preference for sex-based language, and specifically language kind of defined around the Gammy theory of sex. And under this language, the term woman refers to an adult human female, and consequently, trans women are types of men, trans men are types of women, and non-binary people are members of their respective sexes. Additionally, I define homosexuality around same-sex attraction. It is not homogenderality. And then after some more very opinionated takes on gender vocabulary, I move into a note on autism vocabulary. And this section is more annoyingly centrist. And one of those annoyingly centrist positions I take is the idea that the pathology and neurodiversity paradigm should have more of a unification rather than one champion over the other. So the pathology paradigm in its extreme would teach that autism is nothing but a disability, and in its extreme, the neurodiversity paradigm would teach that autism is just a difference and signs of disability are due to society. I look at the pathology paradigm and I say, you know what? My routine building instincts let me write the longest thesis project this honors college has ever seen. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about that. But then I look at the pathology, I mean the neurodiversity paradigm, and I go, you know, I've had panic attacks because of the way a seam line hit my sides. I don't think society's in the wrong for calling that a disability. And so I have them meet in the middle, and I conclude that autism is a bit of a mixed bag. 
where some parts of it can be a disadvantage, some are just a neutral difference, and others are advantageous. And I do acknowledge that because I'm talking about something I think that is harming autistics, I will draw more upon the pathology paradigm, but that's just because of the nature of my topic, not because that's how I think autism applies everywhere. And then on that note, I enter chapter three, catastrophe strikes. So as much as my sources did not agree with each other, the one thing they could all come together and agree upon on was that autistics are disproportionately trans-identified. They couldn't agree why or what should be done about that. They could at least agree to that starting point. So I accepted their starting point, and then I asked the question of why would this be? And throughout my book, I discussed 16 different theories of where gender dysphoria might originate in autistics or otherwise another desire to transition, and specifically why those 16 theories would apply more to autistics than to other groups. And with the time I have remaining today, I would like to give a very brief overview of the rigid thinking theory. So the rigid thinking theory puts forth that rigid thinking about gender or sex norms would result in someone identifying as trans. So just the idea of, oh, blue's in my favorite color. I should be a boy. And because autistics are prone to rigid thinking, it would therefore follow that autistics would be more likely to identify as trans. And this theory gets a lot of pushback. For starters, there's a disproportionate number of non-binary autistics. There's also Audi gender, fasci gender, and spinny gender. And if one goes really, really far into the internet, they can even find this thing called cat gender, which all the bottom four were all made with autistics in mind. And if one runs with the assumption that non-binary or any of these other identities are inherently not rigid, this poses a serious issue for the rigid thinking theory. And this assumption that non-binary is inherently not rigid was something I found written out in three peer-reviewed research papers. They don't have a citation for it. The researchers just made that assumption. It got peer-reviewed and approved. So as long as that stands, the rigid thinking theory probably is not true. But there is a pretty solid defense to these counter-arguments. So the one study, well, no, the two studies that put this idea of rigid thinking and non-binary identities to the test found that non-binary identified adults were lower in mentalizing. And low mentalizing is often seen in children. It's just developmentally appropriate. They haven't developed it yet. And with low mentalizing, kids can identify someone as a man. They perceive him as a man, but he puts on a dress and they can no longer recognize him as a man because their thoughts about dresses being tied to women are so rigid that they can't process the concept of cross-dressing. So low mentalizing is tied to rigid thinking, and it's also tied to rigid thinking about gender slash sex norms. So thinking about how this would manifest with the seemingly creative identities like non-binary, I came up with a concept that I call queer sexism. So in traditional sexism, in eighth grade, when I stopped shaving my legs, there were a group of five who on a pretty regular basis would follow me through the hallways and scream, damn girl, you need to shave those hairy ass legs. They took my sex and they sought to regulate my behavior. It was a pretty straightforward example of traditional sexism. Then I got to high school. And in high school, there was a girl who on multiple occasions told me that I should be trans, or at least non-binary, because I didn't shave my legs. It was the exact same norm. She just flipped up the order of how it was applied, so she took my behaviors and sought to regulate my gender identity. And that, to me, is still a form of rigid thinking. It's just been flipped around, so it's much harder to notice. And then from reading other sources with interviews with non-binary adults, as well as children who, again, have that low mentalizing, this sort of thinking became very apparent. And then with the idea that queer sexism is a form of rigid thinking, I can return to the claim that autistics are more prone to rigid thinking, so thus would be more likely to start adopting this idea of queer sexism. Additionally, as I established in chapter one, Autistics do not generally follow gender slash sex norms, 
which is what queer sex of them acts upon, which would thus push more of them to identify as trans. And then also something I bring out throughout chapters one and three is autistics don't put as much weight in being a member of their sex. That's not something they tend to view as important as what neurotypicals do. So if someone says, hey, this thing you're really interested in or you really like, you have to identify as the other sex to keep doing that. It's probably much easier for the autistic to leave their sex behind because they're not as attached to it. And then some might be wondering, didn't you call a truce with norms in chapter one? And yes, I did. I called a truce with traditional norms. And there are four reasons why I'm willing to call a truce with traditional norms, while I'm not willing to call a truce with queer sexism. So first and foremost, I don't think queer sexism is helpful. I look at the traditional norms, like girls having a preference for playing with toys that have faces, and maybe that does build life skills that serve them later on in life. So I can see that as a helpful norm. I have no idea what good could have possibly come out of me in high school getting persuaded that I should identify as a man or non-binary. I don't see that helping me, my community, or society as a whole. And then the next issue I have with it is in addition to just not being helpful, I find queer sexism to be physically dangerous because the friend in high school didn't just try to convince me I should identify as a man or non-binary. She'd bring up puberty blockers, testosterone, binding, and had I gone down that track, surgery might have entered the table. And all four of those, including the blockers and the binding, have some pretty hefty side effects. And then next up, I find queer sexism to be very self-contradictory, where the girl who kept pushing it onto me in high school would frequently wear a shirt saying gen I mean, bread rolls, not gender rolls, with no recognition that her attempts to persuade me to transition very much had gender norms baked into them. And I've seen that pretty consistently where the people thinking in ways that are consistent with queer sexism claim to be against gender norms despite rigidly pushing them. And when I see something that, that is that logically consistent, I don't really trust it because I don't think that the person has fully sat down and thought through what it is they're arguing for and what it is they actually want. And then finally, I don't like how queer sexism acts upon mentalizing. I think that puts children and autistics in a bad place. And as I do start to discuss some more in chapters four and five, I don't like what this does to language because it starts to make it kind of feel a little bit more childish about things I'd rather talk more maturely about. And with that, I end the section and I will now be having time for questions, comments, concerns. And if you would like to read more, hopefully the book will be available on Amazon within the next couple of weeks. <laughs>